What happens if someone shows up to your wedding uninvited? What are you supposed to do? Kick them out? Make a scene? Shepherd's hook? You know, like how, what, is, what happens in that scenario? Well, hello, lovely humans. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Jamie Wolfer. I'm your online wedding planner here to help you plan easy and stress less because you deserve a stress-free wedding day. Um, And this is something that plagues so many couples. They're like, but what if someone shows up that wasn't invited? right? Like what happens if a bunch of people RSVP no and then show up anyways? What am I supposed to do? And I'm just going to nip this in the bud real quick from the top of the video. This is not something we see often, okay? Uh, now it could be culturally specific. It could be something that I'm just not used to. Like you might be like, no, my family is literally, they will say no and then just show up anyways. I can't speak to every single experience, but I can list on one hand the amount of times we've experienced an unexpected guest show up at a wedding. But to assuage any of your concerns and to kind of help you calm down a little bit, because I know this is a huge, huge fear point for a lot of couples planning their wedding, I thought we might as well make a little video about it. In the off chance that it happens, what you're supposed to do. So without further ado, let's just jump right on into it. First and foremost, we're gonna set the tone before we even get to the wedding, okay? If you are concerned, especially if you were one of those like a minute or two ago that was like, yeah, my family's gonna say no and show up anyways, I strongly encourage you to set some parameters up ahead of time so we have less to worry about later on down the road. So let's start with the invitations. Be very clear who you are inviting on your invitations. That means on the outside of the envelope, okay? you are not going to write the Wolfer family if the children are not invited. You're gonna write Elias and Jamie Wolfer, which by the way, I haven't mentioned this in quite a long time in the video, but my PO box is down there. If you wanna send me your save the date, or if you wanna send me your wedding invitation or anything like that, I've literally had people send me photos or handwritten notes. You guys, I open every single one of these and I love it so very much. If you've been around for a hot minute, you know I actually even scrapbook some of them, okay? Because I'm a nerd. But if you feel like you want to send them to me, you can. Back to the topic at hand though. If you are just inviting the couple, it is, you know, our names are Elias and Jamie Wolfer. That is what you would put on the outside of the invitation. That's already letting the guests know these are the names of the people that are invited. Now, if you say Wolfer family, I'm assuming by that statement, you're inviting the entire family. Okay. In a situation like this, if you are giving them a plus one and you don't know their name, you can write and guest. Or if you do know their name, you can write their name there instead. Try to think of any other unique circumstances, like if it's an adult child living at home with the parents, maybe consider sending an additional invitation for the adult child just to make the writing uh, on the envelope easier. I don't, there's, a, there's a bunch of ways you can do this, but make sure that the outside of the envelope sets the tone first. The inside of the envelope, if you are having an RSVP card, you can put two seats have been reserved in your name or in your honor, or you can limit the amount of RSVPs that they have listed under their name on your website, whatever website you work with. I know a lot of them offer that as an option. So the Wolfer family would be limited to five RSVPs, right? Uh, well, six now, oh, I had a baby. <laughs> There's six of us, weird. So whether they're sending back in their RSVP cards or going to RSVP digitally, you are locking them into a certain amount. Now, sometimes people will write back and like cross out the number and write a bigger number to which you go, nay, we're not doing that. No, uh, we only have those five seats available to you. So you can't bring seven or 10 or 11. Yes, it makes for an uncomfortable conversation, but you'd rather have that before your wedding than on your wedding day. Am I right? The next thing you want to be careful about is the amount that you are talking about your wedding online. It's location, time, date, uh, those sorts of things. One, because it's kind of tacky. I'm going to just throw that out there to like talk about an event at great length if you're not inviting these people and you're telling them the day and the time and basically sending them a verbal invitation to come along. You know, like maybe don't do that maybe just don't. You can talk about it. Like I'm not squashing your desire to talk about this wedding. I know you're excited about it. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I would refrain from sharing any pertinent details on social media that would encourage anybody to show up. Um, I know this is also a very sensitive subject because sometimes people don't want a certain person to be there. So they have to be very tight-lipped about it and very locked down. Um, we've done a celebrity wedding before where we literally had the digital invitation password protected so people couldn't get into it. So you can get pretty extreme with this and pretty specific with this if you need to, but I just want to encourage you. Wasn't it Michael Buble who got robbed, right? When he was at his wedding because they knew he wasn't home. So they like went and broke into his house. Not that you're a buble, okay? Like there's only one buble, right? 
but let's be smart about the details that we share online. One, so we're not, you know, hurting any feelings when we don't invite people. And two, we're not encouraging people to show up by giving them the date, time, and location of the event. Food for thought. Now let's talk about what happens on the big day itself if uh, someone does in fact show up. Well, one, do we know them, right? Because wedding crashers are a whole different thing. We had a, a wedding happen at like a national park. I think it was a national park. Um, no, state park in California where people could go hiking nearby it. And the groom was a graphic designer and he created a sign that said like, if you're crashing this wedding, you better be funny. <laughs> and we literally had people walk up and they're like, is this a wedding? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they saw the sign and they laughed. Uh, and of course, while they didn't like actually crash the wedding, uh, there were definitely some looky-loos um, and some people who were quite interested in the goings-on but didn't actually do anything. We have, in fact, had one singular wedding crasher. One. And honestly, it was hysterical. I wasn't even there. <laughs> it was at a hotel, uh, which is, you know, considered a more swanky type of wedding location and a drunk woman walked in and made herself at home on that dance floor yes ma'am she did she just she's she was doing some some moves and stuff and things and uh, i didn't hear about it afterwards because uh, most of the time i work every single event but every once in a while we have other teams that work other ones and having them like walk up to her and be like hi i'm so sorry this is actually a private event you can't be here and she's like okay and just left she was feeling herself okay she would she would have danced anywhere but if this does happen at your event we need to gauge first of all how communicative is this person are they inebriated are they you know really drawing a lot of attention to themselves to figure out how to tactfully handle this not because if they're quiet we're gonna leave them no but more so if they're quiet and or not completely inebriated we can handle this more gently right like we don't need to be as forceful about it so if your wedding is in a location where it's close to the public and people could easily come in this might be something you want to keep in mind as a just in case have a plan in place have have a family member, members of the wedding party, just kind of ready and prepared should someone waltz on in and start cutting a rug on your dance floor that they can step in, communicate with the person and have them leave. This is also another reason why it's a really good idea to have a coordinator because that's something that as a planner or coordinator, I take care of on someone's wedding day. So you simply have someone go over to them, have a conversation and encourage them to leave. Should they be aggressive or frustrated or completely inebriated and not really wish to do so, it's not a bad idea to have some strong folk around to help you know encourage the person to leave right it's very rare that it actually happens but in the off chance that it does warn some wedding party members to be able to step in because the last thing that we want is for you to be confronting the person right it's your wedding day let's keep you in that happy little bliss bubble and have somebody else deal with it either a professional or someone strong now i do have one genuine concern when it comes to wedding crashers specifically and that is your gifts your envelopes, your cards, those things. Now, as a general note, most of the time people will gift checks. So it's not like there's gonna be cold hard cash in a lot of those envelopes. Uh, ideally, there should not be cold hard cash in those envelopes. And we have only had one incident where uh, actually gifts and the cards were stolen not from a crasher, actually someone broke into the vehicle later and retrieved them out. But one thing that we are consistently mindful of as planners and as coordinators is the location of the gift table and how public the space is. So this is another thing that a lot of people kind of just forget about. Uh, they put a gift table up, they have people set things down, they have their card box, etc. You need to assign someone to remove that really early in the evening like that doesn't stay there all day or they remove the cards out of the box and leave the box there in case someone left a card in the car and they need to come back for it those need to be hidden they need to be put with your personal effects they need to be put in a locked car they need to be removed and put elsewhere most of the time obviously if they are taken and they are just checks that is redeemable right we can get that back but on the off chance that's a huge bummer and gifts that's a huge bummer we can't get those back either so i'm less concerned about like the entire event being crashed and more concerned about the location of your gifts so just as a side note for this specifically make sure those are handled and hidden practically speaking after cocktail hour so guests can show up if the gift table happens to be there, they can place them there. Maybe your coordinator removes the cards during your ceremony. More can be placed during cocktail hour. They're removed again and then checked periodically throughout the night in case any additional cards are put in there. But someone needs to be actively watching over that um, and removing them and putting them into a safe space so you don't have to worry about it. Now, what about someone that you know? 
Because those, I think, are even harder than the ones that you don't know. You know, someone coming in and just dancing on your dance floor for five minutes is not that big of a deal, right? But someone who clearly told you no or clearly wasn't invited showing up is a whole different beast. Let's talk about the emotional aspect of that first, okay? Now, if they said no and showed up anyways, again, I don't think we've ever had this happen, ever, where someone said no and then ended up coming anyways. Not once. But this is why it's kind of a good rule of thumb to round up when it comes to your chairs, especially because as people are walking into ceremony, they're not going to sit perfectly. So let's say you have 172 people, you're going to want like 180 chairs, maybe 185, because naturally there's going to be some gaps <laughs> between some of the groups and they're not going to squish together perfectly. Um, so having extra chairs is a normal thing to do anyways. And then you can just readily have them available. And the off chance that you do have a person show up that RSVP'd no, usually it's not so many people that you would need an extra table. So I don't recommend necessarily doing that unless you're doing unassigned seating, which is definitely a topic for another time because I get spicy about that one. So we're going to pour grace on this situation. Like we get that they said no and now they're here and that's irksome. Like that's bothersome, but technically you did invite them. They were supposed to be there and then just something got in the way. Um, and so they thought they couldn't come and, then now, and now they could make it. Let's talk about the uninvited one. The one that you're like, you're not supposed to be here for whatever reason. Maybe you're not close with them. Maybe you had a falling out. Maybe they have an issue with someone in your wedding party, with a family member. Maybe there's a disgruntled nature here that probably should have been discussed beforehand. So if you're watching this ahead of time and you are aware that there's someone you're not going to invite, it might just be worth having a conversation if you feel like that relationship is in a place that you can do that. Just to be like, hey, you're not coming. Or to a mother or to a family member. Hey, that person's not coming. We're just, we're avoiding drama. And I just recently did a video on uh, eight ways to cut your guest list if you're feeling like you're in a bind. And one of them is, if there's drama, cut it. If you need an excuse to cut something, this is a very special day, a sacred day to, to you and your fiance. This is important and it's fun and it, you wanna have a blast. So let's say this person shows up and there's feelings. First of all, if there is a concern that they're going to, again, alert someone else. I don't want you confronting anybody on your wedding day, if at all possible, unless unless you're a spicy miss, okay? Unless you're just like, I'm gonna do it whether you tell me to or not, Jamie, because this is just who I am as a person, I get that. But ideally, we want someone else dealing with that. Again, much like with a wedding crasher, if it could be your wedding party, it could be a family member or a friend who's prepared, uh, maybe someone who knows this person as well, or if you are working with a coordinator, have them step in. This is part of our job. This is what we do. This is why we're there. Because on the off chance that some relative that you weren't expecting to come does end up showing up, I want to be prepared. Your coordinator will want to be prepared. Any of the staff or vendors working your wedding day will want to come alongside you and help you to keep this day sacred. So as a wrap up real quick, one, doesn't really happen that often, at least in my experience. Could be a cultural thing. You could be anticipating otherwise. But uh, we don't typically see a lot of wedding crashers. Two, if you want to avoid it, make sure your invitations are worded very clearly and your RSVPs are very clear. Three, make sure you don't talk about the wedding details on the interwebs, okay? Like, don't be spewing all the info out there for people to assume that that's their version of an invitation or to, you know, just even give them the details. Whatever we want, whatever... Whatever's next, wedding crashers. Make sure someone else deals with them, not you, ideally discreetly. And if someone said no, but ended up showing up anyways, don't stress about it. You probably have overflow chairs anyways. The caterer always has a little bit extra food, so I'm sure they'll be fed. It's not going to be that big of a deal to have one person show up, maybe two. It shouldn't affect your event too much to have one or two people show up that said no previously. And lastly, if they're uninvited for a reason, have someone else intervene on your behalf. It doesn't have to be you. You do not need to interact and you can have someone else who loves you very much come alongside you and help you deal with this. So that's what we have for this week's video, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you are stressed out about this wedding planning situation, can I please invite you to come join the master plan? I designed this entire course with live calls with me every single month. Like I'm physically there. It's not a recorded webinar. It's me answering your questions every single month in real time. I'm there to help you work through some of these things. We have office hours there every single week. I think we have them on Tuesdays from like three to five where I've got one of our planners sitting there at the keyboard answering your questions every single week. You do not have to stress through these details on your own. I'd love to tackle issues like this with you every single month while walking you through the nine steps from point A to wedding day, where you can plan easy and stress less because you deserve a stress-free wedding day. And I'd love to be a part of that. I will link it right here if you're interested. I would love to see you over there. If you haven't done so already, jump on down there, hit that like button and subscribe to this channel for more tips and tricks for the modern day bride. And until next week, bye guys.